Hello, I'm David Hepworth. Thanks for clicking this word in your ear. The latest of hundreds of chats Mark Ellen and I have had over recent years, some between ourselves and others with musicians, authors, comedians, and other people we like. If you'd like to help make sure they continue, you might consider being a Patreon supporter by visiting patreon.com slash word in your ear or just by liking or subscribing in whatever way you prefer. On with the show. You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So I've got two conclusions from the United States presidential election. The first one is, obviously, we have to congratulate Donald Trump on winning his third presidential term, which is just remarkable, you know, and he didn't even have to serve the one in the middle. Um, And the second thing, more seriously, is that um, the the question it throws up in my mind is, is this the final nail in the coffin of... The celebrity endorsement, Mark. I no, because, I, I because I, a lot was made, you know, in the run up to this election about the fact that Bruce Springsteen, Beyonce, I don't know, Taylor Swift, you know, all the all these the biggest names, the biggest oh, names yeah. possibly available, all turned out uh, one way or another for, or supported Kamala Harris. Meanwhile, as far as I can see. <laughs> Donald Trump, which is absolutely extraordinary when you consider his kind of power and celebrity, how how few actual celebrities have actually entered into his wake at any stage. You know, you look around and you, you look behind Ted, uh, you, you, you look behind uh, Donald Trump, and you might catch a glimpse of Ted Nugent. You'll and see Ted Nugent, you'll Kid, see Rock. Kid Rock, you'll see Kanye West. That's going to help, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And you're going to see Billy Ray Cyrus. That I think is a. I don't look. That's the sum total of people. Now let's not forget. But on the on the Harris ticket, you've had Ariana Grande, you've had obviously Springsteen and Beyonce, Taylor Swift, Barbara Streisand, Streisand. Uh, you've got uh, Billie Eilish, Bob Weir, Cardi B, Carol King, Cher, Eminem, the Foo Fighters, James Taylor, Neil Young, Stevie Wonder, Bon Jovi, Madonna, and Lady Gaga. That's just the tip of it, basically. <laughs> I mean, it's basically everybody, isn't it? But the, and J Lo and all those the really bit really significant people, and you could argue. That it hasn't made any difference at all. I mean, I don't, we can't tell, we can't tell, can we? I mean, I totally, totally understand them doing it. You know, we've got pals in America who are saying that they were so keen that Trump didn't get in that they felt they had to go out, bang on doors, distribute leaflets, campaign, do anything, because they wouldn't be able to live with themselves if he did get it, and they felt they'd done nothing. And that's exactly the same with these guys on the scale that they operate, don't you think? But I, th- I think it tells you, I think it tells you all sorts of things. One is that that I think it, that may have come across as slightly sanctimonious in the yes. end. I think a lot of celebrities going there, well, look, we're the right thinking people and you're, if you don't agree with us, the wrong thinking people, may have come across as slightly smug and slightly superior. I don't know. I'm not sure. But the other thing I think is that, I, that you're assuming that people will only <laughs> – have kind of relationships with people in the entertainment business whose politics they agree with. You know, it's like saying, can Springsteen and Lady Gaga and Beyonce have got to that Taylor Swift? Can they have got that big in terms of music sales, in terms of ticket sales, without Republicans (laughs) supporting them? Well, obviously not. And so I think that tells you that, that a lot of people are quite able to make a division between the people that they regard as entertaining, and what those people's political inclinations are. Don't you think? They don't necessarily see those things as absolutely where to go. I don't think it works so well the other way around. I think you'd be harder pushed finding a very a devoutly left-wing person going out to a Ted Nugent or a Billy Ray Cyrus concert or whatever. But also the people who came out on the on the Trump ticket – that will have done them a lot of good because a lot of other people who were supporting Trump would think, well, I don't know who this guy is, but you know, he's obviously in, in my camp. But I, I think, think I think you've got to pull back the, the there's a bigger there's a bigger narrative here, actually. Which is well, A, 
the campaign in the United States, like the campaigns in Britain, made absolutely no difference to anything at all. Nothing sure. anybody did or said in the three months leading up to that made any difference to how people were likely to to cast their vote and they decided they just they do that you know it's a kind of long-term thing uh you know and it's vaguely patronizing to suggest that you know if, if somebody puts out a certain message on the jimmy kimmel show or whatever on a, the week before it's going to suddenly nudge it in one direction or the other but i think the other thing is which is interesting is that um is that you know, kind of names like musing names, particularly, used to bring with them some perceived kind of rebel credibility yeah. that was seen as being beneficial to have on your side. You know what I mean? Um, and I, I don't think they have that any longer, you know, because it doesn't matter what any of these people say, you know, Bruce Springsteen, Lady Gaga, Beyonce. Whoever, Dave Grohl, anybody you'd care to mention, they are they're part of what what not long ago people were calling the one percent. These people are immensely wealthy and comfortable and powerful. It's very unlikely that any any anything that's gonna happen with any of these governments is gonna change anything in the world of these people. Not in their in their world, you know, because they're Can I butt in just for for on, one quick sec? Because the, the, the majority of the, the bit of the issues with this election was the economy. So people yeah. were voting. They were saying, Was I better off four years ago or not? You know, this was apparently blamed on Biden, but obviously COVID being the main cause. And they were thinking, well, yes, I would. And if, if I'm if I'm going to choose this guy, the chances are I might be better off. Then that that's, A, a very powerful incentive to vote. And B, the, the idea of being lectured, as you say, by a load of people who, who are not affected by that. It's not affected. It's more because, difficult. You see, being, being, a, being a narrative again, though, you see, it's not just the American election. You go look at the elections around the world. You know, you look at what happened in the UK. You look at what's happened in Italy. You know, absolutely everywhere. Incumbent governments are being turfed out, left, right, and centre, for the simple reason that the popular population doesn't feel it's getting better better off. The whole population feels disgruntled. Okay, that's its natural state. How's the world going? Terrible. Okay. Now, the world of Beyonce is not going terrible at all. You know what I mean? mm. Beyonce, it's kind of, she's, she's immured from the world, really. She lives in Beyonce world. You know? yeah. These people aren't prospering on a fantastic level. So the idea that they, that they would share any kind of um, feelings. Uh, you know, yeah, about we're all how in the, the same predicament here. We're, we're not. <laughs> we're, not. We're, not. We're, we're not Beyonce, not. thank you, dear. We're not no. Taylor. You know, you're doing pretty well. Um, but also, I think I think there's an element of, of just the passage of time. You know, you used to associate the idea of rock stars with rebellion and more specifically with youth because obviously mm. by definition – 30, 40 years ago, all rock stars were young. There was no such thing as an old rock star. Your idea of a rock star was the Rolling Stones or it was the Ramones or it was the Pistols or it was Supergrass or whatever. But it was generally people who represented youth, you know. That's just not the case anymore. So therefore, the, the, the anti-establishment stars of the past now, now come across as being the establishment, don't you think? And, and, it's and furthermore, seen as a and, further, and furthermore... Rock stars used to be rule breakers. Now they're not. They're rule compliers. That's yeah, what they yeah. do. They, they, you know, they, they, they have signed up for a kind of worldview which is largely shared yeah. by, you know, most people who've been to university or yeah. whatever, you know, around the world. They'd all agree this stuff's, you know, acceptable, this stuff's not acceptable. And they've got an increasingly clear division between the acceptable and the unacceptable. And, you know, if people go the wrong side of that line, they're cast into the outer darkness. 
Whereas <laughs> Trump rules, was you know, those people who stormed the Capitol, you know, those are the people who feel more rebellious. Those are the people who are driving uninsured vehicles. You know, those are the people are, you know, have probably more firearms than they have licenses for. Those are the people living in some kind of cash economy outside of the law. I don't know. I'm not, I don't mean that's like a generalization. I'm talking about some of them. But you got the get the feeling that those people are genuinely kind of more rebellious, actually, don't you think? Well, uh, Trump's whole Trump's whole shtick is he he runs in opposition, doesn't he? Even yeah. when he's president, even when he's president, he pretends yeah. he's in opposition. That's the whole deal. It's I would like to do all these things, but they won't let me. They won't let me. And that's the that's the whole deal. Take no responsibility whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like you know the, this whole cult of rebellion was invented by. Um, well, Marlon Brando pulls up in in the wild. What's he called? The Wild Ones. That film where he plays the leader of a motorcycle gang who who um, revs into town and uh, threatens, you know, the established order. And uh, somebody says to him, "What are you rebelling against?" He says, "What do you yeah. got? What do you got?" <laughs> and, and, that's that's the that's a very You're attractive still with a world where the grip on reality. So there was one key moment in this whole campaign where I'm I'm used to the idea that Donald Trump can say things that are manifestly untrue and just keep bulldozing on because tomorrow I'll be saying something even louder and even more ridiculous and we will have forgotten that anyway. But the, and those things can't be disproved live, as it were. But there was a, a, a thing, I don't know if you saw this, where he was at one rally about a week to go, and he said, uh, my rallies are always full and no one leaves before the end. And at this point, the camera panned around. Yes, it's real, it. You probably saw it, a virtually empty <laughs> arena. Now, I know that that would not be shown on right, right-leaning right channels, but it existed, that piece of footage, and obviously it was everywhere all over social media, you know. And it made me think that you can say things that are wrong and can be proved to be wrong actually in the moment and it doesn't make any difference at all. It doesn't make any difference at all. Not because I think I sent you the, the, the clip um, yesterday of a, of a young chap involved on a, in a podcast, in, 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 British guy, but obviously lives really in the moving. Uh, Yes, it is. <laughs> really and he moving. said he said his response to the election was, he, he, I think he said he was 25 years old or 24 or something like that. He said, so, you know, I was 16 when when Trump kind of first came into the into the public arena as a potential presidential candidate. And I've now worked out I'll be 29 or something yeah. when this when this guy ceases to be president. He says, and I just, I just want my life back, basically. I'd like to have a day where I didn't spend a significant amount of time thinking about him. You know? That's right. I thought that was a really uh, good point. Very, very good point. And, and uh, you kept saying there are so many things in the world that should be interesting me, but I'm just bogged down by this and yeah. my conversations yeah. with others about it. I thought that's true. It's suffocating. But that's the key interesting secret, and it made me think yesterday after I'd seen that. You know when they talk about in football, or top level sport, but particularly in football, we talk about clever managers like Mourinho and um, Ferguson. Half his power was he got into their heads. He got into the opposition's heads. You know, yeah. they they use this expression all the time. And so, you know, if you were playing against Alec Ferguson, he, he would make some comment in a press conference a few days beforehand that would just take the pressure off him and put the pressure on you. Well, Donald Trump does that. He one thing he has achieved is he got into the opposition's heads. They are obsessed with him night and day. The level of antipathy they feel towards him is far more powerful than any level of affection he attracts among his supporters. Far more powerful. And actually, what, we appeal, all what appeals to it to him about his uh, what appeals to his supporters about him is the fact that he gets in the head of the rest. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Because there's a kind of acceptance that we don't, you know, tr Trump's lot don't run the world, really. They just lob, you know, they lob cabbages at the world, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and so what they really want to do is make the uh, the lives of the people who actually do run the world uncomfortable. That's what they do. And they've yeah. done that enormously successfully. You know, whether they can make any kind of fist of actually 
running it when they have the controls themselves, you know. We wait and see. But anyway, so how do we begin? Yes. But anyway, celebrity endorsements, they're finished. And I say no bad thing. The Word Podcast, prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. Dave, Quincy Jones, who we missed because we'd done the podcast, I think, last week. Very sad. And I thought it was interesting that... um that Soul Bossa Nova from Austin Powers was one of the <laughs> that we heard. Although it's just a classic kind of, it's like Alec Guinness, uh, you know, Star Wars actor dies, you know. <laughs> Quite <laughs> rightly, that you was see, the I one track. Right. Right. You know, because I actually... I, know, I, thought, see, I would have done the same thing. That's the track that everyone goes, oh, did he write that? Rather than kind of, it's my party or come fly with me or something, you know. Or well, it, it, it's also, I was tended to say, you know, before Michael Jackson and Thriller, and off the wall, obviously. I did tend to associate him you know, in the part of my head where I keep, you know, the soundtrack to the Italian job or or a personal favourite of mine, which is uh, In the Heat of the Night, you know, the yeah. Sidney Poitier, Rod Steiger film, which starts with that brilliant um, Ray Charles vocal, you know, in the, in the yeah. Heat of the Night. I just love that. I do tend to associate him with that kind of my the, very favorite. artful stuff. Go on. Yeah, no, my favourite you just mentioned was is uh, is on days like these. The opening section of the Italian job, which all of us listening would have would, would have seen, is the bit where the Lamborghini powers down the northern uh, Italian coast, going through the tunnels, isn't it? And you get on days like these with that wonderful orchestra, <laughs> it's just so beautiful. Yes. And it goes on for ages, and then it ends, and then there's a, a section of a, a bridge for about 10 seconds of the sound of the Lamborghini's engine as it heads towards the next tunnel. And at the end of that tunnel is the bulldozer, and the <laughs> film starts. You think, that is immaculate. Can I just stop there at this point? We're recording this on Sunday morning. And now Mark said that I'm going to spend the afternoon watching the Italian job on the sofa. <laughs> After a roast dinner, we're going to watch the Italian job on the sofa. Nodding off at some point <laughs> when Benny Hill comes on. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, I just think I've seen that film so many times. It's just magical. Of course, to have it at Christmas. I know I've told this before. You used to have it at Christmas because I, I felt it was the one film that, that combined all the generations. My mum and dad, you know, our generation and our kids, everybody loved it. There's something in it for everyone. <laughs> and of course, he did. It's got the, um, has it got a song, The Self Preservation Society? Yeah. An old coward appears, doesn't he? <laughs> Mr. Bridger. <laughs> Mr. Bridger. I love an old coward in the Italian uh, job. Walks down the steps in the in the jail. They're all banging, uh, you know, on their metal plates. It's just uh, it's wonderful. But anyway, what are we talking about? Yeah, Jones, yeah. I, I thought I, I thought that was interesting. And there was, uh, I, I, it struck me reading the, the things about him that I did that he the way he made music was extraordinary. That he he. He would find something. I think it's my part is a good example, actually. He'd found Leslie Gore, and he then spent ages going through 200 demos until he found It's My Party and oh, then really? recorded her a certain way. He thought, this is the singer, this is the song, brought in a load of brass, which he did on lots of his um, uh, productions because he'd been a brass player, he was a trumpet player himself, you know, and that he worked back at everything. He had he had the biggest Rolodex in the industry, and he looked at every production as being like casting for a movie, actually. How can yeah. they get that sound? You know, people like... Um, the various members of Toto that he got working on Thriller. Steve Luthaka, was it? Luthaka, uh, yeah, Luke 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 That's right. And uh, Jeff Bocaro. They had a particular sound that he was looking for. So he would cast around, as you would making a film, looking for particular actors or looking for particular technicians to get that point. And and there's a and Thriller is a really good example of that, isn't it? Because didn't he? Didn't they have to? Didn't they try and find the title before? They he was involved? desperate. He, he thought it was really important to have. a title because when you know he comes on thriller after having done off the wall which is obviously a big success you know what seemed like an enormous success at the time but um but when he started to make thriller the story goes then the opening day of of um shooting which is you know the parallels to the movies yeah. will continue through this and then he, he gathered everybody there you know michael jackson and and the musicians, Rod Temperton, and uh, I think Bruce Sweetian, who's the, who was the engineer, 
And he said, he made a little speech. He said, we are here to save the record business. That's right. Because, because don't forget, it was a terribly low ebb, you know. It was the post-disco lag, you know. And Fleetwood Mac had, had had rumors and all that, had done enormously well, but then Tusk, you know, relative failure and so forth. And so there was a feeling that, uh, oh, there's no future in this in this record business. And so he set out to make a blockbuster, Definitely. And um, and so he felt that having a title was a really important part of this. And so people, people had long lists of potential titles. And, of course, you know, the, the eventually what arrived. Was that the Midnight Man? Was that well, one very well that's, yeah, Midnight Man and Starlight and Give Me Some Time, Hot Night, Lights Out. What, lights yeah, out. Yeah, you know, Rod Temperton apparently had long lists. And Thriller was originally called Starlight. Mm-hmm. The actual tracks thriller was originally called Starlight, which is really weedy if you think about it now. Yeah, it and then, and the last minute, no, changed it. It's called Thriller. And so, putting out a, a, a record called Thriller at that time was seen. God, that's a really good idea. That's a kind of movie idea. It's a yeah. marketable idea. Yeah, and you I think come that, up with the concept, and then you construct. And then you go story. back and you make the record. You know. Yeah. It's like movies. They start with the, you know, the poster almost, and then you and then you go back. You start yeah. with the trailer, and then you go back. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and uh, you know that's very much what what happened with with thriller the record. You know, and it's got to have all these component parts. It's got to have something that appeals to middle of the road radio. It's kind of things that were going on urban stations it could have oh, dance that was so strategic wasn't it there's a, power, there's a dance song there's a track with mccartney which was I the mean, first was single just, i think wasn't it was McCartney? You, yeah it was yeah yeah the girl is mine what you do is you 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 look for you, you i mean the way records used to be made is you tried to make the best record you could and hope it sold a lot yeah, yeah. They, they kind of looked at it the other way around and they yeah. said what 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 is needed to sell the most numbers of yeah. records imaginable? And let's work back from that <laughs> to make sure that all those things are covered. And the other thing that struck me was that a lot of what records used to rely on was the publicity value of the person who made that record. There wasn't much publicity value in Michael Jackson, actually. At the time. And I speak as somebody, one of the very few people who interviewed him when that record came out, because he wasn't good at doing interviews he was no. he was odd he was uncomfortable he was he was peculiar he wasn't very charismatic didn't want to do them and so they'd invented this they were using video as the big new thing was it? and vincent price you know and the other thing that struck me was the moonwalk how important a part of the oh, sale huge. of that record do you huge. remember he did the moonwalk i think it was at a, it was a motown, uh, motown special event in 1983 it was a motown special i don't think anyone had ever seen it before and it's absolutely yeah. electrified so it was the perfect storm of ways to sell that record that didn't involve michael jackson being sparkling in an interview yeah know, i mean yeah, yeah it was amazing. way beyond that it's so funny isn't it thinking about the, the the first time the moonwalk was seen on the on that motown special and of course Round about the same time, I think around about the same time, do you remember Jeffrey Daniel appearing on Top of the Pops? Jeffrey yeah, Daniel out of Shalimar. Yeah. Did he appear on his own? I think he maybe did. Uh, doing what we subsequently learned was body popping. Yeah. It? You know, yeah. And that stopped the nation in its tracks, didn't it? You know? it did, very briefly. Everyone was thinking, have you seen this guy? It's extraordinary. Well, but also every child in a playground up and down the UK yeah. was doing that or attempting to do that. You know? Yeah. And I kind of miss the days when big dance moves used to, used to stop the world, you know, when one yeah. person would get up and do one thing that nobody had seen before. Um, but, you know. Well, so, other examples of that. I can't, I can't think, I can't think of many. No, no, not many. It's really all. interesting. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, we were talking a while back about that um, documentary we made about the making of USA for Af- Africa, and that remind this, him, Quincy Jones, just reminded me of, what was involved in making that record? And he really was like a, a, a film director because film directors, one of their main assets has to be immense diplomacy, dealing with trying to get people to do what you want them to do and they may not want them to do and persuade them as nicely as possible. And you thought you, that film, do you remember just, he was dealing with so many complicated, warring egos, all desperately trying to take the record over. There's a moment where Stevie Wonder 
insisted that some of the lyrics to the song should be rewritten in Swahili. Mm-hmm. Remember that? And Bob, and he, Bob Geldof, I think, pointed out that uh, they don't speak Swahili in Ethiopia. That's right, so don't worry about it. I know. <laughs> Is it, oh, it didn't, yeah, anyway. Um, it, it's funny, I was talking to Bob Geldof about this only this week, Mark, uh, of, were, which, yeah, of which more later in, in, in a few weeks' time. Uh, and he was very much contrasting the uh, the American sessions with the UK thing. They were very different, but the Americans, you know, it, it had to be Quincy Jones to kind of corral those kind of egos. He because, was the only person of that. Because he'd stack. been there a long time, you know. So, know. so even even kind of Ray Charles is impressed with Quincy Jones, you know, what I mean? because he'd been yeah. there. So, how old was he when he died? The other right, ninety one. So, ninety one. Yeah, I mean, do you think of someone who? Who, who combined working with Lionel Hampton, working in the Count Basie, yeah. or with the Count Basie Orchestra, you know, playing as a trumpeter, and then right through to all the big commercial records he made, all the film soundtracks. And in the end, there he is with, you know, points of view about Taylor Swift, perfectly justified in his mind, in his mind that she couldn't write songs and just, it just, it just. Is that what he said? That, Did he say yeah, she, yeah, write she wasn't a good enough songwriter? Oh, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if I agree with that actually, but there we are. He, he, he just thought it was uh, maybe maybe because she needed a team of people around her. I'm not sure actually. I think it's but, interesting that he had the nerve to say that actually. <laughs> yes, I do too. <laughs> because yeah, because normally there's a great pile on, isn't there, when anybody says yeah. anything anything yeah. disobliging about Taylor Swift? Yeah, he obviously, he obviously didn't care because he was Quincy Jones. So anyway. But on the on the on the subject of 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 pivotal records like like Thriller, it, it's the anniversary of two, isn't it? Two box sets, yeah. which I thought was interesting. But one of them being Biograph, Bob Dylan. The Biograph, the Bob Dylan box, which came out in November. Exactly what is it? Exactly for, for uh, no, it was nineteen eighty five. Actually, wasn't it? So right, yeah, thirty nine. And I yeah. really remember that coming out. I dug out my copy and had a look at it this morning. It had a. It was. I'd never seen anything like it. There's a huge, great book in it, isn't there, with pictures of his parents, old shots of him with Susie Rotolo, with Ginsburg, with Bruce Springsteen. Um, it, it, the key thing was that it, it had 18 of the 53 tracks. How many al- albums was it? I can't remember. It's five it's records, five three CDs, records. I think. When yeah, yeah, 18 of those 53 tracks had not been issued previously, and I think nine of them were unreleased recordings. There were songs that he recorded for those particular records. And it went right across the board, didn't it? It was, it was apart from, I think, Self Portrait and Dylan Desire, Infidels and Empire Burlesque. I think pretty much every, there were outtakes from every era of those, of those records that he made. So you had Abandoned Love and Caribbean Wind and Baby I'm in the Mood for You and all those. And that was, do you remember how exciting that was to get unreleased material? It was I immense. Know, I don't remember that ever happening before. No, I couldn't. I was trying to think about this. And, you know, I wrote about this in, I'm going to plug my book. Uh, in, in my, in oh, my book, hope I, <laughs> hope I get L before I die. Um, and um, because I think oldies, if we can call them that, used to be regarded as things you kind of sold cheap, you know, because they were oldies. Yeah. Whereas Biograph takes absolutely the opposite tack, which is we're going to charge more money for these because they're old, you know, and because you've never heard one of them before, you know, and it was, it was a little bit compromised in the sense that, that the obvious thought, well, we're going to have the obvious greatest hits on here, but we're going to make it more attractive to the collectors by adding a bunch of things that, that were not among the greatest hits. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to charge a lot of money. I can't imagine, I can't remember exactly how much they charge, but I know it's pretty hair raising at the time. I know it's a lot of money, and I, re- I remember not even bulking slightly. At the cost of it. I can remember thinking it's worth it. Oh, well, sure, sure. But that, that kind of begins the, the gold rush, isn't it? You know, so, so Paul McCartney and so forth must have looked at that and thought, well, he got away with it. Ten years later, or yeah, however many years later, yeah, well, the anthology cool. and all those kind of things. And so we now, we now have the realisation that people will pay 
any amount of money for kind of artfully packaged old stuff. And, you know, I, I, I have in front of me, I'm looking at a page for the uh, plugging the recently released reissue of John Lennon's Mind Games. Oh, isn't it amazing? Uh, the Ultimate Collection super, super Deluxe Box Set. There's a special edition um, that that has, oh, I don't know, two limited edition uh, reproduction artworks, you know, hologram nine engraved, LP. EP, nine LPs, picture discs, Blu-rays, $1,350, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Pounds, I think it's pounds. Oh, well, well, no, I'm looking at dollars. Okay, but it may oh, well. Yeah, okay, yeah. well, all right, could be pounds as well. Yeah. There's, yeah. Damn, there's hardly any difference. Yes. Yeah, um, and yeah. and thirteen hundred and fifty <laughs> quid for a record that I mean w- was pretty pretty, pretty good average. When it came out, actually, it was that, how many times did you go back and replay Mind Games? Not I got many. it out the other day, and I thought, looked at it, and I thought, I bet I have not played this record. In fifty years, yeah, <laughs> you know. it's incredible. But isn't it? uh, you know, you, but if you'd said at the time of the release of Bob Dylan's biograph, hang about for forty years, you will see a, a copy yeah. of John Lennon's Mind Games being sold for fifteen hundred pounds. Yeah, know, I know. You'd have thought that was that was pretty. I have another theory about biograph because it was so so influential, as you say now. Absolutely, everybody is keeping everything, and then oh, yeah, knowing yeah. that possibly at some stage in the future to be able to repackage it and sell it as a box set. I have another theory. I think it influenced the whole the, the film industry too, because around that time, well, a bit later, because DVD was slightly later, wasn't it? The DVD industry started producing DVDs with with, with kind of deleted scenes, yeah, 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 and they and also with uh, with soundtracks and commentaries. But deleted scenes is a, a little like. You know, it's a little like out. It's out there. Are there are outtakes? Exactly the same thing, really. Mm. And that was incredibly attractive. You you got a package with your favourite film in it, and then you saw a load of things that they cut out. All of which you used to think I can't imagine that ever being in the film in the first place. But how amazing to see it! Yeah. So I think Biograph really was. Fun well, it's, I, it's very. It's interesting. So I was talking to somebody the other day about. I think that their son had appeared on television in some some program. I can't remember. And uh, and I said, oh, I'll just find it on YouTube. And they said, can you yeah. do that? I said, you find anything on YouTube. So we now live in a world where we accept that absolutely everything ever released is out there, and you'll be able yeah. to, you'll be able to just get it somehow. You'll be able to listen at least listen to it once. Whereas in the world, the world into which Biograph was introduced, that was not the case at all, you know. So you still felt that you still felt that that the bulk of the interesting stuff was somehow denied you. You know, it was behind a wall somewhere, you know, and it might be parceled out. You know, well, here are 18 Bob Dylan songs you've never heard before. Ooh, whoopee. Whereas nowadays you think, well, it's all out there, surely, isn't it? One one way or another. Well, you know? the bootleg series, the Dylan bootleg series, obviously prompted by the success yes. of that. Prove that yeah. to be wrong because ev- with every single, and the records he's making now, rough and rowdy ways, there must be loads of outtakes, may- maybe even possibly done deliberately. Yeah, but done deliberately. At some stage they can sell them and that people like me will really, really want to hear them. But the other box set whose anniversary it is, is uh, and, and uh, how many years is it, is is the Bruce Springsteen and the Oh, yeah, that came out in November 86, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so years. yeah, is that is that the number of years? Yes, thirty eight yeah. years, and and of course you have to remind yourself that at the time, you know, live Bruce Springsteen stuff of listenable quality was quite hard to find. You know, even if you were prepared to, you know, go through the hoops you had to go through to buy bootlegs, and you still did in those days. The quality of the kind of mastering and the pressing and so forth would leave a lot to be desired, wouldn't it? You wouldn't yeah. be listening to a lot of that stuff for pleasure. Whereas the the, the, the idea, the excitement that attended the release of this, was it five LPs again? Yeah. You know, three was. CDs and so forth. Live stuff recorded between 1975 and 1985 
And that seemed like an extraordinarily long time. Well, it's only 10 years. You know what I mean? It's only yeah, and, and got such a reaction. Do you remember? such right. excitement. R- Rolling Stone, I remember, said it was an, an embarrassment of, of riches. The New York Times said it was an unprecedented event in popular recording. They opened Brilliant. Tower Records on Broadway at 8 o'clock that morning. There were yeah. queues around the block. There were trucks coming in from the factory in New Jersey or wherever. Yeah. Um, you're delivering them into the into the back of Tower Records, and then they were piling them high, and people were just going in there, you know, just could, just couldn't couldn't resist, couldn't get enough of them. And there was that, you know, it was the idea that it was kind of mania, but it was mania not for new stuff, but for old stuff. For old stuff, yeah. And uh, and people felt that they kind of had to buy it. And uh, and so you got this mad rush you know, the week it came out. And then a few months later, people were stuck with tons of them because yeah. it didn't continue. You know what I mean? It was a kind of, it was a strange phenomenon. People wanted to be involved. You know, they wanted to yeah. buy it. And once they bought it and they played it once, they put it away. Probably never played it again, actually. Um, no, it just didn't carry through, did it? Because you had to be an obsessive Bruce Springsteen. It's not like people are going to say, you really ought to hear this Bruce Springsteen guy. Go out and buy a massive box of all this stuff. You know, uh-huh. you either were converted or you weren't converted. Yeah. But in 1985, also 1985, 1986, really significant time in terms of, as you say, of of of, of the mania for, for the old, you know, of, uh, Live Aid. Well, it starts there. Live Aid, you know, and to some extent, Q Magazine, all those things. Yeah. It's something just, just put the foot in the ball and look around the picture and say, let's, let's go back. Yeah. And, 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 and be nostalgic. I don't, I don't remember there being nostalgia before that. I remember it all being about, no, in terms of yeah, rock yeah. music, no, it, was no, about no, no. Yeah. it was about, but occasionally a little look back and, oh, Nick Drake was an interesting guy, but it wasn't nostalgia, it was journalism. You know, this is nostalgia. This is, let's go back and remember what we were like when we were 15 and we first heard so and so. Really mm. different. Mm. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. Two other anniversaries uh, this week November the 9th, 1966. John Lennon met Yoko Ono at the Indica Gallery. And mm. November the 9th, 1961, was the date that Epstein first went down the steps of the cavern and saw the Beatles. I think that's interesting. It's particularly interesting because if you think of the speed at which the Beatles travelled, you know, that there was only five years between that's those incredible. events. And two other things really struck me, actually. <laughs> I, I was thinking about this morning. I've been reading this Ian Leslie book, which we shall be talking about in future, uh, which is coming out in uh, in uh, February and March called John and Paul, which is fantastic. And it, it's, it, it struck me that they played the Ed Sullivan show in February 1964, and just over two years later... April April sixth, nineteen sixty six. They recorded "Tomorrow Never Knows." Yes, I mean, right. that is just that's in two years. two years. And the other thing that struck me was that they last played the Cavern Club in August nineteen sixty three. I mean, they were obviously doing really well then. It was a kind of farewell, but they still played the Cavern Club August nineteen sixty three. They played Shea Stadium on August the fifteenth, nineteen sixty five. Exactly two years later, it is breathtaking. Don't you think? It's extraordinary. No, it's funny, the, the Indica Gallery thing, because uh, I, I discovered the uh, not long ago where it was, because I, I I do a lot of work at the London Libraries is in St. James's in, in the West End, and around the back of the London Library is Mason's Yard, yeah, which now has the White Cube Gallery rather dominates it, but anyway. Uh, and Mason's Yard has two, has two um, pl- places of, of Beatles interest, particularly. Um, the Indica Gallery was in Mason's Yard, and, and, I, and the building where it was is still an art dealer, I think. Uh, and then literally a stone's throw away is the Scotch of St. James, yes. the club where the Beatles used to hang out, and uh, where Jimi Hendrix first appeared before the kind of the glitterati uh, yeah. when he came came to london in 1966 and he, you know it's literally you know a few paces walk between the two of them and it's just extraordinary you, you stand there in mason's you think this this is the 
is the ground zero of swinging in London. You know, if you're going to put a plaque in one place, that's the place you would do it. You know, turn left. If you, if that, if that's you where John there, May which you are a lot, I know. You you tend to see tours going by. I'm sure you've seen. Oh, them. I have a look at them. Yeah, yeah. I know people being taken. What a I'd quite fancy going on one actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take you on one. <laughs> let's go, let's go, let's go on. Let's but, lecture each other. <laughs> But it is just extraordinary when you think yeah, about it. Yeah, Epstein, Epstein first sees the Beatles at the, at the cavern, November 9th, 1961. So this guy from a record shop who's hardly ever heard an amplified pop group in his life yeah. stumbles down the steps at this place, decides, oh, there's something in these guys, starts at that point. And, and you know he, he's never managed a pop group. <laughs> he's never been in the, never been in their company ever. And within what two years, they are the biggest thing in Britain. You know, with, within three years, they are the biggest thing Thank in the you. world. And uh, you know, so and between 1961 and 1966, you know, it's just it's just extraordinary the changes you know it's a the whole I, a world in which the, the idea of john lennon yoko Ono is even conceivable wouldn't you know would not have existed a few yeah. years earlier you know you just it can't wouldn't be the reference points to be able to make it work <laughs> absolutely the whole idea of you know you know going up a ladder and uh you know whatever he did when he went to the uh, uh, show at the end of King a tiny poem on a Pinned yes. the ceiling, wasn't it? That's right. The just, word yet. Yeah. Yeah, just absolutely astonishing. Dude. We shall never see their like again. Anyway, um, you're probably wondering. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. This this has been an absolutely wonderful way to spend, I don't know, 40 minutes or so. What can I possibly do to ensure that this continues? Well, worry not, there is a way you can do it. I know, get a pencil and paper, if people still have such things, and go to patreon.com, patreon.com, slash word in your ear, and find the one of the many ways that you could become a Patreon supporter. And had you done so, were you to do so, you could join such lucky people as this week's birthday guest, Phil Hopwood. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. Okay, and our birthday boy is Phil Hopwood. Phil, you've got a conversational log to chuck on the word in your ear fire, have you not? Uh, I, ha- I have indeed, chaps. I have indeed. Um, so my, 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 um, my conversation point is, so if you were to be able to be teleported back into time, to a particular moment in time, like apparently the, the Tomorrow People did, or Doctor Who with his TARDIS, and you could go right back to a particular incident, and it can't be something straightforward, but like you know the Beatles on the on the top of Abbey Road, you know, from, you know recording their last concert, you know, something that an incident that you want to kind of get to the root of, or what really happened, what would that be? Oh, good grief! What about you, Mark? Have you got one? I've got. Well, I've got. I've got I've got one where I, I would want the truth to be revealed, but I wouldn't want to necessarily be there, and that's Bob Dylan's motorcycle accident. Oh, really, really good good good. Because there was no police report, yes. and he never went to hospital, but he had a book deal, a tour contract, a TV show, an al- album schedule, and was going to appear at Shea Stadium <laughs> two weeks later, 55,000-seater. And he didn't want to do any of it. He them. didn't want to do it. So, so I, I'm just putting two and two together here. That he may well have, you know, given himself a nasty little scratch when he fell off his motorbike. I, I, no I, I've, got, I've, got a, I've got a few here. And by the way, this is a big talking point. Have you ever mentioned this to anybody? Um, you've got to ferret out the, you, you can't just go with the obvious ones. Like, you know, a good one would be Flew in Mac, the room's r- recording sessions and stuff like that. Yeah. But mine, do, do, would, would you yeah, like to Yeah, go on. Mine, which I come back to again and again, and it is so complex in so many ways, is the whole story about Sid Barrett and the Wish You Were Here recording sessions. Oh, yes, yes, yes. When he turns up. When he turns up. When he turns up. Looking like like the the picture, the classic picture of him, is looking like a a, a somewhat down at hill CD Uncle Fester from the Adams family. Because they they were recording Wish You Were Here. 
And yes. they were actually mixing Shine On You Crazy Diamond. Or, yeah. no, I, I, well, both which you were, they're both about Sid Barrett, aren't they? Yeah, um, it was June the 5th, 1975. That's the it, actual date. Yeah. And he goes to Hypnosis down in Denmark yeah. Street first and talks to... Okay, yes. Talks to Storm on Poe, and yeah. uh, and um, you know they they tell him that you know the band are in Abbey Road. So he turns up. I've always, I've always, I've always thought, would he get past the commission? I, that's what I can't believe. Well, that's right. They yeah, supposedly they turn so- round and he's in the room. How would they possibly have let this suspicious-looking bloke in? So. What, what's so interesting with, with this is that if you go to all the main players, right, you never can't quite get a straight story. So if yeah. you watch, there's a, there's a DVD called The Story of Sid Barrett and Pink Floyd, which actually has a 40-minute interview with, with Roger Waters and another 40-minute with David Gilmore. Oh, Both really? of them look really awkward about everything. It's, right. it's, it's like it's, yeah. it's all quite awkward. Nick Mason's autobiography. Um, you, you know, it, it sort of gives the, the high level, but like nobody went across to say hello to him. And and then what was most interesting is that I, I was on a podcast. Uh, so I, I was able to submit a question on the podcast, the Hustle podcast with John Mamro, and he had John Lecky on. And John Lecky was in the next the next room, and oh. went nip nipped into the Pink Floyd session because there was a beer there with some there was a beer in the fridge there. So he went into there, and so he went in. Obviously, kind of saw something weird going on. Nips out, closely followed by the band running off. So. Oh. So my hypothesis is that what actually happened is that the band kind of saw something there, didn't quite know what to do in that classic, very English way, kind of scarped left, left it for the right away. Away. Uh, that, that left is, it, left that it is, is going to go to make a phone call. Yeah, exactly. That right. is, I, that I, I is, might be completely wrong. Though. No, but so that is what rock stars. That's what any bands, kind of rock bands, do when yeah. confronted yeah. with any socially difficult situation. Yeah. They this run is away. The that, by the way, with Sid Barrett originally. Um, he left the band because they didn't actually pick him up on the way. They through. didn't pick him up. That's right. They rather than him kick up. him out. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> so right. They never even told so, him he was so out. It's, it's just everything's such an English story as it well. It is. And, I, and, I, I, and like, it's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect as it is, you know, and it's, um, you know, it's like all these stories. I sort of don't want to know the truth because, mm. because we've also got that situation with bands that, you know, if there's any, if there's any, if you're ever involved in anything, it's a shared experience discussing it thirty years later. Yeah, everybody's got a slightly different version of it. That's right. He, well, that's history. The, history with, tells you that. History tells you that you you never actually know what's going on. You yeah. just never know. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And even if you're in the room, you don't actually know. Either. Yeah, absolutely. Like you wouldn't be agendas. Yeah. You know, Mark and I might reminisce about working on Smash Hits forty years ago, and the. And we will remember totally different things, you know, and uh, we're the best will in the world. And we're, we're not Pink Floyd, you know, and there's no controversy attached to it. No. It's just, and, it's, uh, have you ever read the anthology it, thing where the Beatles meet Elvis, which is incredible? And the three of them talk about meeting Elvis and they remember it completely differently. <laughs> and this is yeah. Elvis. This is their absolute. Like anyone you're else in a room. The Beatles. You're in a small room. How yeah. hard can it be? <laughs> totally yeah. different memories. Even the clothes yeah. they were wearing and everything, you know. For yeah. so, it's, so, it's, so, it's, so, it's, so when I was, I have to say, I mentioned that I was going to have this topic with a couple of my friends and my, my brother. Who is actually my brother is a uh, is Gen X, firmly Gen X, born seven years after me, right? So um, you know, I, I kind of said that, and he turned around to me and said, "Well, that that's yeah, that would be good for you, for you, someone like you, yeah, you'd like yeah." The people on the podcast, I'm sure they would like that. But what I would like to know, because he's of a different generation, he would like to be the the day that Jerry Hall- Jerry, Jerry Halliwell left the Spice Girls. All right, okay. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's a, a generational thing, really, isn't it? You know. Yeah. I, I, there's something about rock bands that kind of they lend themselves to stories, don't they? You know, and then so and so came in the room and said so and so, and then so and so stole his bass guitar, and then you know, and everybody can kind of imagine it, can't they? Um, whereas, whereas when you get into the world of the Spice Girls, it's totally different. You yeah, know. It's just it's not that's that's not my world. I, I've got I've, I've got one other one, by the way. Go on, if, if, if you are if you are interested, a, a different one, a more joyous occasion. So, what, one thing that another incident that I go back to again and again. So, if you have all the money in the world, kind of, if you're a very wealthy author, if you are Douglas Adams, who's now sadly passed away, 
and um, you've you know you've written Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and you've done everything. What would you, what would you do with your money? Oh, what, you're asking me what I'd do with yeah. money. What, what would you do? With, what would you do? Because I'll tell you what. Well, the government would take most of it. That's basically the first that's <laughs> the right. first point. So let me tell you what. You Douglas don't have Adams to worry about it too much, you know. Go on. Yeah. So Douglas Adams in nineteen. It was actually the July the nineteenth. That's nineteen ninety seven. It's recorded. He reunited Procol Harum for the weekend oh. for, for a big reunion concert with the with the proper band. You're the one that's kind of split in 1973, not the kind of the original one with Robin Trow, which came back in the 90s, right, which really right. failed. But he actually, he got together Procol Harum, which had really played together as a that, that band in Carnage for 20 years, and all offshoots as well, like little offshoots, and they all got together in Red Hill where he lived. And they had a big weekend. Oh, well, that's good. And I, and yeah. I, and I, and I a like little that movie in the waiting. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and of course, he's no longer with us these days. But what a, what a great thing to do, you know? No, that's I, a good I, I've got all this money. What I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go back and I'm going to get the original incarnation. Yeah, reform of Procol Harum. <laughs> Just because I can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, that's no bad thing. No bad no, thing. No, that's at all. Very good. Okay, great. well, there's loads of, loads of food for thought there, Phil. Thanks for sharing that with the massive... And uh, happy birthday, happy if, birthday we're, if we're not too year. late. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. 